Salut everyone and welcome back to another episode of Victoria to Horror Darkness and Lake Falls Campaign. I am your host, Shredder James, or you can call me James for short. And look everyone, I finally got the title screen working. Um sadly though I got it working on the very last episode of the Lake Falls campaign. Um Basically, I'm gonna have to cut the series short because, um, um, well, let's, let's go back a little bit. So, as you guys know, we had started this third great war of awesomeness, and, you know, it was going to be the world, the war to end all wars, or at least that's what I was coining the phrase to be. No one, no one ever is gonna steal that phrase, it's the third great war to end all wars. It's never gonna come up in a dictionary, but it's going, I'm just going to say this right off the bat. I tried my hardest. Uh, I tried my best to get the game working and to get th through all those battles. Because as you guys know, you probably only saw one clip of me, of the freezes and all that kind of things. I went, let me just say this, I spent a great deal of time trying to get that to work. Trying to get it to work so that we could play it, so you guys could see it. It just did not work. I mean, even by my, even without Fraps running, the game would crash. The game would, you know, cause major problems and just, you know, do all this, like, stupid, laggy stuff. So, you know, what was it? I just, you know, I just decided that, well, first off, I decided, one, it would not be worth watching the game at this point, okay, because I don't, if I was watching the series, if I was my own viewer, put myself in your guys' shoes, I would not want to be watching the series, even if I loved it, I would not want to be sitting through a lag every single second, you know, I'm talking about this cool battle going on, and it's already like, I'm just starting to get to the battle when you guys are watching it, so I don't want to get to that. And two, I couldn't, because it would just crash every single minute. Every single time I'd load up. I mean, I'd get, get to a, load up, play the game for a little bit, and it'd crash. Load up, get to the game a little bit, crash. And this would be, again, this would be without me even recording fraps. So, you know, with fraps on, I don't think we'd ever have a chance. So, you know, it just, it's a sad thing to say, so... You know, I I had to do that. So, but you know what? I decided something differently. Instead of um, ending the series right there, giving up on my dream of, you know, fi finally completing a Le Fonts campaign as, well, basically Le Fonts, I just said in the title. But I decided I'm going to tank through the lag and tank through a lot of things to get to the ending of this game. Because I was so close, and, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get there. I'm going to sprint all the way, I'm using a lot of, I use a lot of sprinting analogies, but I'm going to sprint all the way to the finish line to make sure that I can get this for you guys, because you know what, I think what I'm going to do in the next, like, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, I don't know how long this final episode is going to be, but however long it's going to be, I'm here to, I'm here to think this will entertain you. So what I did was, um, I basically went through, tanked the entire rest of the game, and let me say that was a task on its own, but I'm not going to focus on that. I tanked through the entire game. And what I did was, let me get into the actual game, what I did was, is that I saved at every single point, or at least most of the points that were savable, because I couldn't get any save from 1930, because it was just so laggy, and 1929, I think, was still too laggy, so, um, 1931 was like the first save I could actually legitly get, and that is where we're going to start, and I think you guys are going to be quite interested in about what, what happens between now of the game, and what happened at the end of the game. So, as you guys know, um, we won the war of the Third Great War. I'm just going to start that off there. And after the war, um, our country was kind of in a little bit of a bad state. Um, we had a little bit of trouble. So, you know, we had to kind of, we had to kind of reorganize some of the military, move more troops towards Irish land, and um, do a couple of weird organizations. So, um, I'm going to cut the video right here, and I'm just going to log into that, because um, unlike Shen Plays, who when he did his um, big uh, Let's Play of Tahiti, I'm not going to show you guys like the actual map until we're actually in there, because I, I think it gives a little bit more of a surprise of what's going to happen. So, see you guys in a second, and we're here. So, as everyone can see, um, if you guys look very closely, there are a couple of little differences in the world. One is, um, let me, t one is, um, Albania was formed, see, 
that guy that wanted me to form Albania, I did it. And yeah, I, like I said, I made good on my promises. When, I, when you guys told me to make Albania, I made Albania. Alright, so yeah, that was basically from the Great War. That was basically a step from the Great War. Um, what else happened in the Great War was um, Persia got Mosambul. And yeah, those are the only things I could like negotiate in the time. So, there we go. That's what happened in the Great War. That's what happened in the Great War. So, anyways, let's actually talk about some of the changes that happened in the map. Um, well, first off, one change that I think is pretty immediate and pretty funny is that the uh, Britons um, finally changed their name from y the Great British to the Republic of Britannia. And I remember looking at this, you know, just looking casually over everything, you know, making sure my sphere is all good and everything. And just looking over and all of a sudden I noticed that the name is now the Republic of Britannia. And I'm just like, holy shoot, they took my advice! Yes! They finally acknowledged that they aren't technically a uh, United Kingdom anymore and that technically the Republic of Britannia. I was really happy of this change and just enthusiastic about it. And um, I thought I got a little bit of chuckles out of it too. So, you know. Alright, so that was that. That was just kind of a minor change. But one of the big changes that happened in the last thing was, you know, when we were playing Sweden, Sweden was dropping out of world powerness. And um, by the time the world the world war ended they were basically out of it so basically what happened was is that um they dropped out and the person that replaced them i never thought this could ever happen but australia everyone australia became a great power and that is something i never have seen in any game in any of my games i've never seen australia become a great power and rise to this and what I like to also mention, they only have a population like comparatively, um, uh, what is it? The Ottoman Empire has a population of 7.7 .7 million. Um, the Italians have a population of 9.4 million. The the Austrians only have a population of about 4.6 million, and they some and the fascist. <laughs> okay. That is something that I've never seen before. So, but yeah, fascist Australia, fascist Australia. That 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 seems pretty good. So, but yeah, and one of the immediate things that they did, which I thought was one of the most gutsy things, is that they immediately ripped New Zealand out of the sphere of the British. And then, when there was a crisis about the Ottoman Empire, they immediately went on the side of protecting the Ottomans. Um, and the British went and went on the side of um. The uh, new foundation, I think it was Bulgaria again. <laughs> yeah, the Bulgarians ruined the chance for independence for me, or for any nation. And I was just like, holy shoot, the Austrians have the guts to actually take on the home country? Dang, I give you props, Australia. But, you know, ultimately I sided with the, yeah, because after that point I said, you know, I'm going to side with the Australians since they have the guts to do that. So, at that point the British lost and Bulgaria was never quite formed in this game. Um, spoilers, but I never could, I just never could quite get over the fact that they kept, they kept restoring and making sure that Albania could never be formed. I, I would just could not take that anymore. I just could not take it. So, anyways, that's what happened, and, um, just a couple of minor things, um, we went to war with Morocco, and, and, s for Spanish conquest, and we're gonna win, no matter what. It's gonna be a pretty big win. And, um, one of the, okay. One of the more interesting things that happened in the Balkans, I bet you guys can always see it and probably wondering is, right over here, as you guys know, Austria changed its name to Austria-Hungary to symbolize that, you know, they're very universal and multicultural and they're trying to please the Hungarians. Well, um, our good old friend Romania, they basically had a revolution in where Hungary became an independent nation. And so, at this time, we are having two Hungries you know, dominating the same sphere, and I just don't know. I was just like, oh my, what? How is this working? How is this, how does this work? Like, do they, like, send postcards to Austria-Hungary, or is Austria, is Hungary, like, the actual Hungary, or, like, who's the real Hungary here? I, uh, it was, like, one of those weird moments, I was just like, Psh, wow. And, um, you know, speaking of, like, 
nations that like free themselves with the uh, Russians being basically destroyed in the uh, German Swedish Eastern Front they um, had lots of rebel problems as you guys can see and um, as we can look through them it's basically gonna destroy most of the nation because they don't have the army to deal with it and actually some nations were formed out of that like Eastern Estonia so you know this is what kinda happened in this let's play and also at this point um sadly the uh, Chinese overtook me in militaristic power and at this point we are way behind them like we are doing that so what I decided to do was I decided to like try to like make eight more dreadnoughts to try to move my industrial power upwards and you know we'll see if that will help us in any way and right now um I officially finished up with every kind of technology of army and I'm now I'm just taking down every kind of um naval power alright so this is what happened in 1931 so be right back for 1932 alright we're back and so as you can see there are lots of changes already and um I'll get into one of the most immediate ones which is a war with Germany. Yes, I got into one more war with Germany. And actually, it was not really my intention to go to war or do anything else. Because like I said, my computer would lag so badly that it would almost be a monthly, almost be a monthly save. And this is starting to lag the computer even when I'm going in close. So, you know, it was a tremendous time. But you know what? The reason why I got into this war was not even my fault. It was, um... It was because the uh, Germans wanted to liberate Hundenstein for their own personal province. And I was like, you know what? No. You don't get to pick on Poland. In fact, I'm the Polish have been my ally this entire time. I've done the best I can to protect the Polish. And basically, I am the shield of the Polish. I protect the Polish people. You don't get to do anything to the Polish people. You don't get to mess with them unless you want to mess with me. Okay? You understand that? I'm glad you understand that. So... Basically what happened was is that Germany tried to do that and I said nope and so I immediately declared war on them and basically it was a kind of a pish posh war. Um, I didn't even have to like do any strategy which I, if you noticed last time I had to like move all my troops to the line and like keep them there and like defend. No, this time I just moved them all in. It was just basically that easy. Um, I was a little bit worried about the Polish front, worrying that they might get conquered again. The Germans actually lost to the Polish. You see, like, over here, there was, like, a couple good armies over here staged up here, and the Polish actually defeated them. In fact, the Polish, as you can see, are very near Berlin, and they actually conquered Berlin, and I was really proud of them at that moment. So, <laughs> good job, Polish, good job. But um, in this war, it was, you know, like I said, just basically a defense war, and, you know, I won't talk about it anymore because I don't want to say what happens. So, anyways, that's what... That's what happened with Polish. I mean, that's what happened with our Germany. I just got in that war because of that. And, may I also add, when we also declared war, the Austrians, the Australians, I mean, Austrians, Austrians, that's the word, not Australians. They had the guts to say, you know what, we're tired of being under the German foot. And declared war, and are actually fighting a war simultaneously for the province of um, Bohemia. So, they'll actually, so, they'll actually make the little Bohemian you know, arch thing right here, and, you know, I was like, wow, now that is really awesome, so, you know, everyone's gaining up on the Germans, I guess, everyone's gaining up on the Germans, so, that's going on right there, and now it's time for the immediate concern, since this was probably the one you guys were looking at, and not, and thinking of, uh, the Soviet Union, yes, the Soviet Union, yeah, they formed, <laughs> <laughs> Out of anything to happen in this game in the last, like, five years, the Soviet Union had the form. Um, t I don't think there's really much to say except, wow. And I hope Lenin hasn't died yet. And hopefully Stalin did not take over because yeah, there might be a lot of deaths here soon. So, um, yeah, that was a bad joke. Gonna stop right there. But, yeah. And I apparently have some rebels over here. I'm dealing with, oh yeah, Korean rebels. I did not realize they were over here for the very longest of times. Um, in fact, I don't think I even... Yeah, let me see. Yeah, as you can see, guys, I did not have hunt rebels on with these units. So I didn't really realize that this was going on. So, yeah. But yeah, 
let me just stop it there. That's what happened this year. Um, I don't think there's really much else that happened. Um, yeah, I have my militarization mobilized. I'm still number one in industrial score, which takes a lot to beat the United States. I mean, the United States this entire time is just right up on my heel. Like, look at that. Look how close they are to, like, gaining up on me and trying to overpass me. But, you know, somehow I'm still ahead at this point. And, you know, I'm kind of praising, praising the uh, one God we believe in in this campaign. So, mm. We also, um, at this point, last episode, last little clip, you guys noticed that I was in a uh, liberal government. Well, what happened was, is that I was like, no, wait a minute, I don't like the liberal kind of style, because laissez-faire does not work for a big nation that has almost established, um, factories. So, I immediately switched over to the drunk nationalist, which, you know, I thought, yeah, these guys are going to be so free, so, like, great, and... You know what I realized about the Drunk Nationalist Party, which I forget to, I forgot to mention in the main campaign? They are almost as bad as fascists. In fact, I think they are basically a fascist nation. You don't believe me? Well, look at their stats. So, they applaud po protectionism, protectionism, state capitalism, state capitalism, as you can see, this is all the same. But one the thing that really made me think that they were um, very much a very oppressive regime, and I really should have, like, got them out of power quicker, was, um... The only, the only people that can vote is the primary culture, which, if you guys know, that's the very last, like, little thing. And, you know, it doesn't really strike you as something until you really start thinking about it. That means that, like, and if you notice about these guys, it's accepted culture can vote. But that means that only, when I had these guys in power, only the, uh, let me go. Only the people that were purely French could vote. That means my French Canadians, I guess in Quebec, or maybe in, um, Santa Cruz, let me see, uh, maybe these guys, maybe they could not vote, because I was such a oppressive regime, and at that point, I was like, what? You mean, at this, when I had these guys in power, I was not allowing any, like, multicultural people to vote? Dang. And then, no, no, it made me think even further back to think of, you know, because I think I had this party in power, like, in, like, two or three episodes in the beginning. And I was thinking, like, back then, I only had, um, like, only landed people could vote. So that means, at the very least, the only people that could vote in the beginning of my country were state, were aristocrats and capitalists that were of French descent. So, that means... People, there were only about maybe like 2,000 people that were in control. No, less than that. Probably way less than that. I would guess around 1,000 people in total of aristocrats and capitalists that were in control of my country at the time. And uh, aristocrats in my country at the time. And that means that they were controlling basically the other like 32 million people in my country. Which just kind of blew my mind and just like made me think of... Um, Things like Game of Thrones and, um, the, I don't know, just like, it just made me blow my mind. So, anyways, that's what happened this year, and as you can see, um, nothing's really changed with the Ottomans, and nothing's really changed with Africa, but, except for one thing, and that is, at this point, I decide, you know what, I want to own Africa, I wanted to own Africa for a long time, but a lot of other nations, such as Austria and America, Preventing me from doing that. So, in retaliation to this, because I kind of noticed this, is that I decided instead of actually, you know, directly controlling Africa, I decided I'm going to indirectly control Africa. So what I did was, I decided to go into every single one of the spheres of Africa, and basically I decided I'm going to sphere every single one of the nations in Africa that are easily sphered for, and basically try to, you know, do as much damage as I can. And as you can see, I'm already starting to work on some of these. Um, like, over here, I got the Principality of Somaliland. That's, I've had that one for a while, but as you can see, I'm starting to, like, gain some prestige with, like, the Grand State of Zamba, which should have been underneath my control, but sadly, the Portuguese are jerks. And the sad part, the, the, the seriously sad part about that is that the Portuguese didn't even keep any of this land. They just immediately freed it when they, uh, when they left, which was like, dude, you didn't... You didn't even try to exploit these people? I mean, ah, that's not what colonialism is about. So, 
Um, and over here, the British had cleaned up their uh, major rebellion problems, which I thought was kind of annoying, but they're also still called the Republic of Britannia, which I love. And other than that, I don't think there was anything else significant. Um, and this was the this was the actual year where the Australians went against the Brit the British, and it was actually for the uh, Greeks. And as you can see, there's only the Italians in on this crisis because I'm busy like dealing with the uh, Germans, and the Germans are busy dealing with me. So, and America over here, nothing really happened except for Canada finally decided to say, you know what, we don't like the state of Colombia being independent. We never liked this. So they finally went in and finally conquered Colombia, which I thought, good for them. That's what they should have done a long time ago. So, anyways, that is this year of 1932. Join us again in 1933. Okay, everyone, it is the year of 1933. And as you can see, there's already a couple of changes, as usual. And I still have this map out. This the Great War Plan map out. So, um, basically what happened was, during this year, a couple things. First of all, the war between me and Germany and France ended in a complete smashing victory for the French. And what I decided to do was, in the war goals, is that I decided, you know, I'm going to take Colon Train. This little province over here that I wanted to take for a very long time. You know, I said, I'm not giving up until these guys give, it, till they, till these guys give, it, give this to me. And since the Germans were already being attacked by both the Austrians, Polish, and the French, it ended in a smashy victory for me. And I got to keep the province, and I'm so happy. And then it made me even happier when the Austrians, um, even with the Germans, like, starting to come down on them and starting to, like, reorganize the army and starting to, like, crush the Austrians, the Austrians somehow hung in there and were able to regain the province of Bohemia, making the Germans look like the classical Germany we think of today, which was awesome. So... And what else happened was, is that I think what, what happened between the Austria-Hungary was is that they finally realized that there could only be one Hungary in the world. And so that Hungary won. <laughs> that Hungary won the exchange and um, this Hungary is just in shambles. And it's, I don't even really think it counts as a Hungary anymore. Romania, just, they are sad. Okay. The Soviet Union still could not quite get themselves together, but uh, with me being very much a oppressive regime, I somehow got a very good alliance with the Soviets and could actually look through the land, which, you know, was kind of interesting looking through and just seeing the entire map red. And then it got even more like, just like, oh my goodness, when the Cold War, when I looked over at America and it was blue. That's what happened. And so, basically during this year, we still are doing our sphering of Africa. Um, steering of Africa, I'm still trying to, like, gain them all these nations, still trying to get all these nations, and, strangely enough, Austria actually speared the Ottoman Empire, which I thought was, like, whoa, and the Ital Ital Italians tried to extend the sphere, and as you can see, my sphere is just all over, okay? That's basically what happened in this year, um, we also are doing the last final technology of the Victorian 2 technology campaign. This was pretty important, and I think right, right now we're doing a major, yeah, we're right now doing one of our massive expansion, massive expansion, um, things. Because I'm trying to make sure that the Americans do not catch up to us in industrial score, because I want to stress the point that they were really close to us. And I mean really close to us, to the very end, they tried and tried to surpass us in industrial power. But we barely kept them at bay, and kept that 1-1 one, one rating. Now, in terms of, um... Militaristic, my, I was coming close to the Chinese. I mean, what, 216-12, and the Chinese are about 2659. Two, I was coming really close to the Chinese, and I was thinking, yes, I'll finally be able to catch up to them. Um, do I, though? Well, let's find out what happens in the next year of the final years of this Le France campaign. Uh, and so, with 1934 rolling around, um, we are still... Um, in deep doo-doo with the, uh, stupid Chinese not letting us catch up in militaristic power. Um, we still have this stupid great map mode out, which kind of annoys me at some points. Um, the other thing, really, this war, this year was really much a peaceful year. I mean, there were really no events that really happened except for, um, we went into one little minor crisis, and I supported the Greeks in their expansion because, you know, I decided, 
I'm going to help the Greeks just as a little bit as I can, and I expanded them just by one province, so for the rest of this year, the Greeks will have one province for the rest, for the ending of this year, or the ending of these years, there we go, and another thing that significantly happened was, is that at the end of this, we finally finished our last technology, so we are officially done with technology, and I'm just like, wondering, what the heck do we do with this now? Because I'm like, what do we do? And I think at this point, we have maxed out every single social reform there is to know the man. I think that happened like a couple episodes, though. But, either way, either way, either way, either way. It happened, whatever episode happened, it happened between now and the other game. We maxed out every single social reform. And, you know, now the Drolt Nationalists were trying to make me reform the uh, party system. Which I was like, okay. I've given, I've given up on this. I'm done with trying to reform the party system. I'm done with trying to do that. This is how the party system's going to work. You guys deal with it. And for the rest of the world, there was really not that many changes. Um, I finally realized that my French my French people were not doing anything, and the Koreans were just allowed to like run amok and destroy all of my precious provinces. So I finally engaged the hunt mode into them and killed all those rebels. Two years before the year would end. So... Um, nothing really else happened, I don't think. Um, at this point, I think we speared a couple more nations. Yeah, we speared the great state of Zimbabwe, of Zamba, no, Zamba, that's Zamba. And we speared, um, Eastern Angloria, no, we own Eastern Angloria. And, yeah, we just basically speared Zimbabwe, but we're still working hard on, yeah, we're about to spear the great Kazmi Union. So, I was feeling really proud of myself there, and... One other thing that kind of made me shocked was that, um, while I was trying to spare all these other nations, the, uh, Great British were actually working extremely hard on spearing the Scottish people. Which, don't get me wrong, it seems right for the, for the English to try to go and spear the Scottish people, but it kind of made me think, like, are they trying to reform the Great Union of Britain? Like, uh, is that what the kind of thought process is, is that you first you sphere them and then you slowly integrate your own people as the leaders and then they start recognizing you as the uh, imperial leader of all. You know, I was kind of thinking that, but then I was like, wait a minute, if Victoria 2 is not in that in depth, this isn't like Crusader Kings 2. So, you know, I kind of let it drop for a little bit and actually I kind of forgot about Scotland for the longest of time and by the time, um... By the time the end game comes, which I'll show you in a second. Ah, uh, okay, end game, everyone. And so, this is the final episode. This is basically what the map looks like and what everything's gonna happen. And so, like I was going on, so I was, like, thinking that Scotland would be, like, you know, doing stuff. And I was like, yeah, no, that's a little bit too advanced for uh, this game. But somehow, the Great British, after they had ripped me out of their sphere and were basically putting points into getting Scotland, I mean, they were... Sadly, they were starting to overwhelm me in terms of points. They reformed the great... They became the great British Empire again, which made me, like, think, Oh, shoot, I better watch my uh, Wales and, and Ireland colonies now. That is not a good sign. So, you know, I don't know how that actually came to pass, but, you know, that's the story I'm sticking with, is that, you know, now, if you sphere... If you're the great Brit... The, if your name is the Great Republic of Britannia, and you sphere the Scottish nation, you will become the great British again, so... Or, you know, rip him out of the other guy's sphere, you'll become the Great British again. So that's what happened with that. And I was pretty shocked and, you know, kind of a little bit, like, proud of the Great British for, you know, being able to do that to me. And even though they are no longer of any importance to the world, they still try to, you know, honor their heritage as being one of the most important nations of the world. So, that's, what, that's one of those things that happened there. And what's happening right here is that there was an Ottoman... Um, an Ottoman-Australian war for, um, basically the Russians, the australia hungarians and the Netherlands joined the war against the Soviet. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot how funny this was. <laughs> I completely forgot how funny this was. So, um, at this point, I'm thinking, holy shoot, we're having a Cold War instance here. So, we have the Soviets versus the Americans for some little minor territory that isn't honestly that important in the long run. And it honestly sparks the invention where he's just saying, wow, this is, that's pretty awesome. And so, you know, give it to the Soviets, even though they were 
never quite realized there's a great power again. They still managed to rise to the point of, I, I guess they still rose to the point of prevalence in the world, even though they never were quite great power again. So, give them props for that. The Bolsheviks are in power, everyone. The Bolsheviks are in power. And um, another war that also surprised me at the very end of this game was the Austria. The Austrians officially sticking it to the Great British. I guess it was because the Great, the Great British became the Great British again. And the Austrians did not like that title. And so they said, you know what? We're going to go after you, Great Britain. And so they declared war. And to get this causes belly. Yeah, you see? See exactly what I said. This is not me making up a story right now. They actually did declare war because they didn't like the title of the Great British. And the Great British said no, and so they went to war. So, that was one of those interesting things. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And as far as I can see, the the Australians are losing. But they did occupy all the necessary territory they were going to get. So, you know, they might actually be winning in a sense. Um, for my empire, what happened in the last years was, of course, I already finished up technology. I already told you guys. Um, for the last year of my last election, the opportunists took power. And I was like, no way. These guys, I've been trying to, I've been trying to destroy the opportunist, opportunist. I think it's opportunist or opportunist. I don't know. Somebody French, leave in the comments, say which one was it, or if I'm even pronouncing it even right, either way. Um, but I tried to get these guys out of power so many times, so many times, but I just could not do it. And so, at the very end of the game, they have the very last laugh, and they get to be in power for the very last day. And I could actually switch right now, but, you know, it's the very last day. Would it really matter? No. It would just be a sentiment, it's just a sentimental victory that on the very last day, they got in power. So, good job for them. And, what was our production like? Well, this is our kind of production. Um, I created lots of radios and stuff at the very end of the game. As you can see, I'm just, you can see lots of radios just popping up. Created lots of industrial score. I'm actually going negative, but the, I'm not going negative. I'll explain that, that when the game is not going, when you go in, everything starts negative. If I were to start the game right now, everything would go positive again, and, you know, we'd have a good time. But then the game would be over, and what would be the fun of that? And so, um... What else happened? We just, you know, France remained as a great power of the world throughout the entire score. In fact, with me just sitting on my butt doing nothing, we actually racked up a lot of um, money. I mean, we're about 2.3 million worth. Yeah. And we're not, doesn't seem like we're ever going to stop. I mean, we're not paying war reparations anymore. I mean, I'm fully funding most of my, most of my industry. I'm not fully funding my naval spending. Oh my goodness, I feel, yeah, I'm not fully spending my navy. My navy is actually not that big anymore. I think I deleted some of the ships after that great war because it was actually lagging me up too much. And we're not actually taxing our people too much. I mean, 50% taxes is nothing, nothing compared to what we've been to. So, you know, at the end of the game, somehow we did kind of give back to the people and make them um, feel happy and plead to the masses of what they want, which is exactly what this campaign was not supposed to be. I was supposed to be this ruthless dictator or monarchy that did not listen to the masses and tried to stay as stubborn and can, and um, right in his ways as much as possible. But in the end, the wind of change got me out, so... <sighs> I hate you, wind of change. And what else happened? Um, we got our Sphering of Nations, as, as you can see. You now guys can see what I was talking about of owning Africa. I basically tried to get everything of my original plan, which, no, not this original plan. Basically tried to go back to the original plan of the new French Empire, so let's apply. Oh, what? Do I have it? Oh, dang, I can't actually, I don't think, can I deport it? Yes, I can! Yay! Okay, so I tried, what I tried to do was try to get the original boundaries of the new French Empire, and I was actually working on the Great State of Zimbabwe a little bit. When the game was ending, I forgot about I forgot about them. Sorry, I, I forgot about you, Natu Zoom Band. I completely forgot about you at the very end. But I tried to get most of these like little nations over here, and I got Santo. Um, at the very end, I think I did a pretty good job because from my original battle plans, you know, this looks pretty good. Except for these little blue states right here of America, I did pretty good. And over here in Siam, I did a good spearing over there. And at the very end of the game, 
Um, Brazil and Argentina are no longer in my spheres, but I'm trying to get them back. Um, hopelessly, desperately trying to get him back before the end of the game, but sadly, I could not. And, of course, Scotland's not in my sphere anymore, and so, yeah. That was the end of the game. Um, let me show you the final, um, inf infrastructure mode, which I'm actually one of the most advanced nations in terms of infrastructure. And, in the last decade, which I was so shocked about, basically every nation in the world decided to come together and basically help out every nation that was not infrastructurally sound, so... As you can see, there's all these nations that are starting to like get these advanced infrastructure. I mean, look at the Soviets. The Soviets are, well, and before I looked at them, they looked all like they were starting to infrastructurize quickly, but they actually have a lot of still zero infrastructure. But for the rest of the places, they started to like infrastructure. Everyone in the world started to help each other out and started to like push them up. Like, look at the Spanish. The Spanish is a great example of this. Like, they were basically at zero, and now they're starting to like get really powerful and then um romania and this conglomeration of hungary and you know cuba is starting to get some and you know just all this help and love of the world was just showing that maybe no maybe the great war did help us out maybe that whole fighting we had of the war to end our wars really was what we were fighting for you know the unity of the people of people of the world and the you know multiculturalism would not affect us you know it was it was just a good sight to see i thought um, Diplomacy-wise, you know, this is this is all basically going to stay the same. Um, Region-wise, not really going to change. Revolt risk is always interesting because, like I said, I was having a couple rebellion problems in Ireland and Wales. And, oh my goodness, uh, it's starting to crash, it's starting to crash, it's starting to crash. No, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Thank you. So, as you can see, ah, now, now it's starting to really, it's really starting to pit a patter now. Um, but as you can see, this is the revolt risk, and this is what I had to deal with, you guys are wondering. That's what I had to deal with the entire time when I was doing this end. This is the recruitment map mode. Um, fun map modes I can do before I have to end this. Nationality map mode. As you can see, everything is kind of the same. Um, China is a messed up. Um, we kind of converted a couple provinces. Like, we did a couple of good, um, French. French were being really quite powerful. And some of these, which is making me happy. In fact, I don't know why. Right here, this province is not mine, but I don't know. And one of the things that, like I said, I think I mentioned this before. One of the things that really made me happy is that I converted this entire province of Panama to me. I feel so happy with that. Because I remember that was not mine. That was originally Colombian, and we imagine do that. Okay, any other map modes before this thing's freezing up? Um, party loyalty, basically, ah, uh, no, no, don't crash yet. Um, basically party loyalty was this. There's lots and lots of, um, not red, but, um, black for the fascists as they slowly started to, like, weave their way through everywhere. We are probably the only light nation in terms of anything. Besides just weirds, we have everything like, oh my goodness, this is starting to become really bad. Ranking, migrations, migrations, basically the United States was getting, like, 60k of people a day. Which I thought was so crazy. Okay. We're gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to end it right here. I'll come back to you guys when I actually have the, uh, um, wait, maybe we can, can we start it? No, we can't start it. Okay, come back to you. And like I said, it was a second. Ah, because I just finished, like, a second. See, like, you see, that was, if you just saw the lag, that was basically what I had to deal with this entire, like, rest of the time. This was, it may seem like a PT Pashi thing, but that was really what I had to deal with the entire time. And... So, here is the last political election, this is what I'm talking about, the Liberals took power in the very last election, which I was like, wow, in the end, they get the last lap. And so, 100 years of momentous years have passed, and we have entered the modern age. The world is a radically different place. How did your country do? Quit. And as you can see, the French are sitting pretty on the throne at the very top of the great powers and so as you can see we have 834 scores a total score um 309 3927 industrial score 2327 prestige score um 2778 well 2078 military score and about 23 million money so we did honestly quite good um, this was our ideology. Again, the the liberals just they 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 just they just know how to always win.
<laughs> I guess it's a simple saying. At the end, we invented about 379 of the world inventions, which when I looked up the rest of these guys, um, well, I didn't look them up. I just kind of went in at the end of the game exactly in the same save and just looked at every single one of these guys. We had the most advantage of inventions out of anyone. We invented more than everyone else, so I was really happy with that. Lunar Seaway, we had number one. No one else even came close to this. I mean, the closest person that came to Lunar Sea was about 80, no, about 80%. 80%, yeah, that was about it. And we had 97%. So that means even in our colonies, the, and even in the Irish, because the main problem was is that our people, when we added the Irish into our colonies, they were the ones that mainly brought our literacy rate down. So I'm guessing that the British, when they had them under their control, could did not educate the Irish. So what we did was basically took the task of that and educate every Irishman to speak French and to learn how to read. So props to us for doing that. At the end, we controlled 289 provinces, factories 238, which was not the most. Um, the Americans had the most, which was um, 315 factories, which, you know, makes it funny how the fact that we kind of kept ahead of them was the fact that we had just, we had more built up factories. They had more like spread out factories. That's how I kind of see how we like came ahead. And Brigade Aids, we had 285. We actually had more at one point. I think right before the Great War, we had about 314. And Warships, 90. That's a lot. So, let's actually get to Ledger. Um, not many of this is really important. Civilized Nations and Uncivilized Nations. Even at the very end of this game, there were still some nations that just could not civilize. And as you can see, they're all listed right here and a little bit right here. Um, Canada is considered a secondary power, and if you know from my Canadian Let's Play, they probably could have rose into a great power if they actually had tried. And, yeah, for the rest of this, is, this is really not that important. Um, this is basically going to tell you basically why I saw the first page. Um, what we have here is a total population of, I think, the, yeah, this is basically the total population of the entire population, so... The Chinese won with 562 million people in the province, in their country, which was, I think, quite insane. Um, British had 244, we had third, what, what, and then the Americans, if we had played like five years more, they probably would have had more, but we barely inched out more than they did by having 187.61 million. So, we also had the most um, provinces which was really shocking. I, I didn't even know we even passed the Soviets in terms of provinces, but then then again, they did lose a lot to like the Swedish and to the uh, Estonians, so I really think the Soviets actually had still the more provinces, but we, at the end of the game, had the more provinces, so yeah. At the end of the game, like I said, see, see there we go, there we go, there's the natural comparison. We had the second most factories. The Chinese were rapidly coming up on us, but the USA had 332 factories, um, and then here comes the literary sea rate, and I'm not counting these countries, so disobey these countries. I was talking about world powers, and as you can see right here, this is what I was talking about. 75, 75, and yeah, just like, we had 97. Like, where are we? We're right here. We had 97. That was our literacy rate. Leadership, we should be not near the top, actually. Where are we? Leadership. I think this is just how many generals we had in total. We only had about 15. Wow, we're about we're about average. So brigades, the Chinese. You know that makes me think. So they had 782 brigades. The British had 350. The Americans had 344. We had 285. So if we had just I don't know if we had just kept, you know, making troops, maybe we could have outbalanced the Americans and British. But in the end, we just could not do anything. Okay, ship-wise, we should be somewhere near the top. I mean, we were, yeah, <laughs> we beat the Americans by two ships. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's almost as embarrassing. That's just as embarrassing as when you beat someone as one ship. So, yeah, we're the best of everyone. Yeah, you only beat by two ships. Well, those two ships still count in the long run. So, what else? We have our political systems. Absolute monarchy was very powerful in a lot of nations. Even until the very end of the game, being an example is the Chinese Empire. They had the thing being as ordered, and the ruling party was a Feng Yang Ying, and the ideology was actually liberal, which I was kind of shocked of. So, I'm just going to focus on the Chinese for a second, because 
what I realized about the Chinese is that they were more, they were the most oppressive government out of any government I've ever seen. And you guys are like thinking, what? Well, first of all, let's go to the Chinese. So, Chinese dynasty. What do they have as a voting franchise? No voting. Um, who appoints their leaders is appointed regularly. They have the Jefferson methods. Meetings are not allowed. State press only. Trade unions are illegal. And parties are only underground. So what I basically got out of this, well, they were also an absolute monarchy. They basically were hated voters and they did not like anyone. Not only that, but, and you could see us, if you want to look at us, you can just look back in my, one of the parts, but not only that, but they also, what was it? Let me see a Chinese. I was also looking over at the side view. Where's the Chinese? China. Okay, I'm just going to go by country. 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 Chile. Okay, it should be somewhere in here. I can't see it. Burma. Canada. Colombia. Huh? They don't have China. Let me make sure about that. Japan. Luxembourg. No. The China, maybe? The China... Oh, I don't see these guys. I don't see China anywhere. Yeah, like Canada. China should be like right about here. Don't wait. Right about here. Yeah, I don't know my alphabet. But anyways, but basically what they had was like no minimum wage, unlimited money, no safety regulations, no subsidized, trickling pensions, no health care, and no school system. And my thought process was, so you mean with all those people of... Five point of uh, five hundred and sixty-five point six one million. You guys somehow were able to keep no social reforms, no minimum health care, no safety wages, no anything, and you guys still became almost a great power. You guys became the second greatest power in the world, and I was just like, Psh. at that point, I'm just like blown away and just thinking, wow, China, you gotta teach me a lot about your system of government, because obviously I did not learn anything, and. All the sins and all this kind of stuff. Not really that important, but I'll go to us. We kind of became close in terms of how many aristocrats were in our country. China had the most. Um, in terms of, I don't remember what this is called. I think those are clerks. The clerks, we had 2.6. Bureaucrats, we had 1.7.2. Capitalists, we were fourth. Um, clergy, we were second. Um, no, those are clerks. What are, those are artisans. Ah, we had lots of artisans still in our country, even at the very end of this game. We had the most clerks in our country. In terms of laborers, we had about 8.77 million. The Chinese were barely inching us out, and so were, and then the Americans had the most. Farmers, third. Laborers, second. Admirals, fourth. Slaves, not even close. And if you notice through the Brazilian... Brazilian size that they still they still had slavery and actually they actually did have a decent amount of slaves still in the country which was sad to see but I couldn't I couldn't really do much about it so slavery still lived on in this age but it was very very weak I mean in a total in total we only have about uh I would say about three hundred thousand slaves still in the world but that's nothing compared to what it used to be and. You know, it just shows the effort by the world to say we don't like slavery anymore. So, anyways, and over here, we are third in terms of military. The Chinese beat us by a lot. We beat the United States, and the Great British also beat us. Um, provinces that made that had the most amount of of um, population in our country was Paris, and Paris is basically going to max out everything. So. Uh, Montagnu actually, wait, Montagnu actually did max out a little bit, but Paris was our most important place, and all this right here, right here, right here, ideology, and provinces, I had the most of this, I'm not even going to show you, because that's kind of disimportant, let's see, places that made the most income, now I thought this was pretty interesting, so the places that made the most income were, um, actually, let me not go all the way down, because that'd be really boring, but the places that did make the most income were Amino Dubai and France North Berlino. But the place and they made like zero dollars for us. But the places that made the most money for us were Matez or Alice Lolin. You know that region that I had always thought that would never make us much money because it'd always be on a blink of war and would always cause us much problems because they would always be the most attacked. 
they made averagely around 3,012 income for us. The output was around 107. Not the best output. The best output was Toledo, which was 295. And the most employees was Toledo too. But still, for Matez to actually come out as our biggest producer of income was, you know, a really good sight to see. And levels, the biggest levels were in Yaza, the Panama region. Shocking. Shocking stuff here. Goods, Alka, input. Yeah, this is income. Yeah. And as you can see, this is the amount of stuff we produced and how much was our most. What was most? What was worth the most? Apparently, ammunition really just soared across the skies. And yeah, um, that's basically it. So, everyone, I want to finally say this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for enjoying this Let's Play, supporting this Let's Play. Like, comment, you know, subscribing to it. It was a fun Let's Play. I had the most fun with it. Um, I'm glad you guys stuck with me, and, you know, um, if you guys have any ideas of what I should do next, or you guys want to comment about what I should do next as a Let's Play, um, you know, please, you know, you can, please, I'd be willing, very willing to hear you guys, what you guys have to say, and, you know, maybe I might actually do it, so, thank you guys for watching this Lay Phones campaign, 